Kato Kato. Um, two weeks ago, the New Yorker magazine ran uh, a really heartbreaking article about the death of Shulamit Firestone. Can everyone hear me? No. Yes. no. no. Okay. I'll speak up. Um, it's that modest thing. Uh, she was a, a feminist revolutionary from the 1960s and 70s, as many of you will know. And she died alone and unwell in an apartment in New York. One of the things that she was really committed to in uh, her work in the 60s was an understanding where we had come from. And she and a group of women went to visit Simone de Beauvoir in France, but she was away on summer holiday. The French are great at holidays. And, um, but, but nevertheless, Firestone did dedicate her, her book to uh, Simone de Beauvoir. But back in the US, they went one day to knock on the door of Alice Paul. This was in 1969. Um, Alice Paul was in her 80s then. She'd been suffragist and she had written the 1921 Equal Rights Amendment. So she ushered these young women into her apartment, according to the article. She was a bit suspicious of them, apparently, but she pointed to a series of portraits on the wall of some very stern-looking women. And she asked her young visitors to identify them, and they couldn't. And as one of the women who was there with uh, Firestone said, that's the problem. How can we pass the torch when we don't know who we are? In my book, I want to tell, I guess, one story, my version of who we are. Um, <coughs> and I think knowing that is, in this issue is, is particularly important because it's still with us. In fact, coming up to the launch in the taxi, I had a call from a reporter in the Bay of Plenty who was asking me about a new early medication abortion service that uh, family planning is offering there and to respond to the fact that according to Right to Life there's a new killing centre now in Tauranga and how appalling this is. So I thought it was quite fitting that I was on the way to my book launch. <laughs> this struggle is still very much with us. Um, and I mean knowing our history is important for everything but as I said, this struggle particularly because it's still right here, right now. And it's hard enough knowing that history for subjects people like talking about. And abortion is not one of those subjects. And I think it was even more taboo back in the 70s when uh, many of you here are the women who, and men who, who were out on the streets every day, every week, people working in the clinics. It was much more taboo then and they were very, very brave, and I want to pay tribute to, to everything you did. Thank you. Also, uh, if you're following abortion news, which I do, obviously, uh, there's about to be a law change in Ireland, and it's not looking very, very good. Um, they're talking about if a woman is suicidal because she doesn't want to be pregnant, there will be at least three, possibly six doctors who will assess her case. Um, but I think it is largely due to the men and women who were fighting in the 70s and 80s that we are not, in no offense to my Irish friends, the Ireland of the South Pacific when it comes to abortion. When I first started interviewing people for my book, I think I was like uh, those women in the 60s, I thought I knew quite a lot. Um, and I remember tracking down and going to meet Rex Hunton. He was the first medical director of the AMAC clinic, which was the first abortion clinic in New Zealand, which opened in 1974, and it was a really radical move at the time, and it's what set off the firestorm that ended up, uh, that, that led to the Royal Commission and to the law we have today. So, being a journalist by training, I was figuring, you know, half an hour, I've got my questions, half an hour to an hour, we'll be done and dusted. And uh, that wasn't the case. I discovered that I was actually extremely ignorant about what had gone on, what they had done, what they had been through. Uh, he told me about some of the attacks that he had faced. He's just this most remarkably gentle person who uh, told these stories, you know, very calmly. His car had been vandalized, his, chi his child had been bullied at school, and there was one story that I guess in retrospect he found a little amusing, which was the phone rang one day, and their youngest son, I don't know how old he was, answered it. 
And his wife, Valerie, listened while the, the young boy said to whoever it was who was calling, no, there's no Mr. Butcher here. Only a Dr. Hunton lives here. <laughs> I actually didn't fit all of this material in the book, which Fergus will be pleased to know. But um, just another shout out to Margaret Sparrow's book. Her book is, does have fantastic first person stories, people who were there, people who went through um, you know, self abortions, doctors, even uh, police officers, and so on. Mine, as I guess she said, and as you know, is more of a political uh, take, you know, my analysis of, of what happened and how we ended up with the law that we've got. And I think uh, people like Di and Margaret want nothing more than to pass the torch to a new generation in this struggle. Um, and I do see, actually, in some, some of the younger women who I, I haven't met some of them, but I sort of know them from Twitter and Facebook, are here tonight. And I do sense a, a rising dissatisfaction and anger about, about what the law is, about the fact that abortion is still a crime in New Zealand. And that's something that despite the best efforts of the 1970s, you know, we did fail to achieve. It's been 36 years since that law was passed by a parliament made up of 83 men and four women, and all the women voted against it. It's time to move on, people. <laughs> so I guess it, I'm hoping that my book will help us know a little more of where we have been, and it will help us move forward, and um, I think as Fergus mentioned, or someone, I will be doing some touring around with the book, with Margaret's book, with other books called The Pro-Choice Highway. <laughs> so uh, that's about it. I just have some thanks, uh, first and foremost, to Wonak, the women of Wonak, who sort of got this whole project going and did so much, just did everything, and were really supportive to me over five years. Um, held my hand and were great, and thank you very much for, for everything you did. Uh, to Margaret Sparrow, of course, because she's, you know, she sort of, there wouldn't be a movement without her, it sometimes feels like, at least today. Um, and to Victoria University Press, and I've met my copy editor tonight for the first time, who's a poet, <laughs> Ashley. And they would all, and my designer for the cover, I shouldn't say mine, she's not mine, she's over there, Zenaida Beetson, beautiful work. Everyone was just so fantastic, and I think the book looks really great, and that's nothing to do with me, it's to do with them. And of course, finally, to all of you for coming. Thank you, thank you so much for all your support, and uh, I think we're having drinks after this ends down at the Southern Cross if anyone wants to come. But we're not going yet. Thank you. <laughs>